Queen Victoria, the big prissy queen, um, I think you'll agree, waged the opium wars in order to make sure she had access for um, Great Britain to opium. So I'm trying to do a kind of philosophical, cultural um, probe to show that there is no white culture that isn't um, being on drugs or in, implicated by that. But this gets projected onto cultures of color. So let us um, have some interventions before we continue. Yes, George. Yeah, I guess I'm going to go a little backwards than what John said. Uh, going back to rhetorical theorist Richard Weaver, he was talking about the image of that, or I'm sorry, the tyrannizing image, and which acts. And it's not a body, it's an actual conception that acts parasitically with the human mind. So the idea that these captains of industry, they're almost, con you could make the argument that they're almost following this tyrannizing image. And as are the other ones of the studies lab. The, so I was just thinking about that, how an idea itself, a capitalistic structure can act almost parasitically within Thank the you. Mind. Similar to how like the little parasites get inside of a plant because you control their mind. Kind of pull them okay. kind of into the top of the Yes, and that would be a, also a, a quite a Derridian um, intervention that you just made, which is that we seem to have been limiting our discussion to a certain conception of the anthropos or man. And, and you were um, you were expanding it to include animals, which we try to um, think through with Derrida, or um, even structure, structural, institutional parasitism and predatory um, behaviors and knockout. And those kinds of industry are also under the spell of this very same person. Right. Well, that's why I want, I want to open the dossier on what you just said, under the spell. And Marx has a lot to say about um, well, you know his famous statement that religion is the opiate of the people. Marx was thinking drugs as well, that it, in fact one is drugged and KO'd and disabled and neutralized by state, the state apparatus. And, and uh, drugs are administered and dispensed in all sorts of insidious ways. And this is something that um, in some ways, I do follow some of the Marxian protocols, also, of course, in the book on stupidity, where Marx is very concerned in his um, correspondence with Engels about how fucking stupid the proletariat are, quote unquote, practically, um, my rendition, which is like, are we insane hoping for a revolution or change uh, when you have to deal with these people? who just want to, you know, I'm sorry, this is some of the correspondence, just want to drink, get into stupid fights, want to fuck, want to, how are you going to make a revolution with this kind of um, base material? You know, this is one of Marx's concerns that um, how are you going to get the stimulant, yeah, right there, with the stimulant of Marx's insight to uh, replace the other drugs that, that uh, have put so many and so much into a stupor. So religion is one of the uh, big dispensaries of drugs because people are just um, totally out of it. They're not around, they're not present, they're praying to some hallucination. According to Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, and others, you know, you can't go earth to so-and-so. Can you come in, please, so we can have a revolution? Or are you really thinking about um, some other world beyond this one? Um, can you please come home so we can do some work together? No, everyone is stoned on something like that keeps them from, from staying alert or lucid, which probably is a lifesaver and suicide prevention center as well. So this is a problem that Marx was very much aware of, which is to say the administration and free clinics that give out stuporous drugs that are ideological. Okay, we're going to have a lot of um, Alex, then John, then Marcus, and then Sasha, and then, yeah, okay, so. So far in our discussion, I've 
heard the relation of the parasite characterized in terms of expropriation, contamination, invasion, even co-constitution. But I want to add to that vocabulary uh, the allergic reaction. Because that is distinct in that it's not a, one does not get sick from the presence of an allergic substance. It's, a, it's your body, it's your body's own reaction to that which it perceives as foreign, which occasions the symptom, occasions the, uh, the problem. I think that's easily translatable into a you know, political example. Absolutely, thank you. And when I did try to work on AIDS and Larry on other um, phenomena, um, one of the key moments is when the body tries to recognize its enemy. And it, in, in terms of autoimmune diseases, it makes a mistake. The control tower is manned by, or womaned by, or parasited by someone who can't read. So they go, whoa, an enemy, let's blast it out of here. This is, you know, so the question of how to even recognize for a body a friendly <coughs> parasite or an enemy invasion is highly problematic. And very often bodies for all kinds of stress reasons or other triggers mess up. They go um, and they overprotect. The sentinels are on the wrong um, program or have the wrong instructions on whom to kill or what to kill. That's very important. Thank you for adding to, first of all, for pointing out that there is a vocabulary that we're building and adding to it. Yes, John. Um, I think what we're doing here is really uh, interesting and important, but I don't want to um, separate our parasitism um, from all the other parasitism. Like um, you were mentioning about the captain's industry and the kind of parasitism that goes with, with images. Um, but language itself is, um, you know, if you were to consider Burroughs' statement um, seriously, that is, is a virus. Um, and, you know, I was particularly interested in Cameron's question to Badu's in his last lecture about the um, timeline um, that we might have the need, the absoluteness, um, or the urgency that we have to, um, to deal with the parasitism on the earth that you had mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, although his, his answer was helpful, and I think that um, uh, Anne, Anne's um, notion of conversion is also helpful in these, um, in, in trying to think through it, um, there, it seems to me also that where, where actually, why wouldn't our language be um, part of that same problem, which is um, the parasite of the, um, you know, the maggots feeding on the burning body. Um, or the burn victim, right? We burn the earth. Um, um, there's a certain sort of, kind of absolute position of human finality um, within that paradigm. Um, <clears throat> and as much as we as we talk seriously around this room, trying to find ways out of um, aporias and 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 whatnot, um, it's uh, how, to, how do we know? Um, where we're going, that we're not, um, in fact, um, part of the same parasite. Well, um, let me just briefly remark um, that Larry and I had a great friend called Kathy Acker, um, a great writer, I think. Right? And she was a, one of the best friends of William Burroughs, and I discussed this with her. I don't think that that ontology that William Burroughs suggests is correct. Language is not a virus. I mean, you may agree or disagree. Um, and I, I don't want to necessarily get into it because we have some texts that we want to read together today. Um, I just wanted to say yes, we're, we're um, struggling. You know, la coula, this might help. La Coula Bout said that in the 20th century there are three fundamental modalities of dealing with, I'm calling it. One is struggle, and that would be the Marxian, that we struggle with, as you suggested, which is the, the modality in terms of um, so our concern for social justice. The other is mission, as introduced and launched by Heidegger, 
who was on a mission. We have a mission. We have a mission of transmission. We have a mission to, to, um, to inscribe things. We have a mission, to, not from God, but from what has happened to us and been left to us after the death of God that Nietzsche <coughs> announced. Um, and the third modality is that of the task with which we associate the name of Walter Benjamin. Benjamin. Um, the task, or in German, the Aufgabe, is also that which inscribes in itself giving up. The Aufgabe, it means it's impossible. It, we take it on as a kind of ethico, uh, politico uh, obligation. But in the word Aufgabe, there's also Gabe, which is gift in German, and give it up, gift auf, give up. The giving, the gift and the give up, giving it up. So um, auf Gabe is the task. So La Coulabart famously said that we have three modes of relatedness to our concerns, our anxieties, our worries our work, our projects, um, and one is the Aufgabe, the task. So you said that we, we are seeking our ways out of aporia. Does everyone know what aporia means? Still good. Um, we can't. There is no way out. So that's why we are trying to work to locate the modalities of stagnancy, stuckness, destruction, without necessarily seeing the exit sign or finding a way out. But how do we live <coughs> within, outside, neighboring these catastrophic um, markers that mark us, that uh, downgrade us, and so on and so forth. I think that that's our struggle, task, and mission here, is not to find a way or think we have a way out. And that was Anne's question too. It, is, are we, is it, can human beings change or find a way out? Um, or do we have to somehow negotiate endlessly with, with what is given, even if the gift that is given is poisonous? You know, so Mar just yes, please. Um, add a footnote to the virus that was yeah. up there. Um, one of the last lectures I heard from Hitler give was on uh, 2001, a space odyssey, and he um, commented on that moment when the ape man flings the bone um, up past the plinth or whatever um, toward rocket flight almost. Um, and refer to it as an uh, image that incorporates a certain tool theory um, that is um, a corollary to slow-mo evolutionary understanding of even invention, uh, whereby um, language would implicitly be a tool. And he said at that point, we would have to reject that completely and would prefer to think of it as a virus. I mean, that's not meant literally. But as an image, I think, for the, um, the suddenness of a mutation, a mutational change, to bring it back to change, there has to be, in addition to the slow time of evolution, to stick to Darwin's theory now, the prospect of a, a sudden mutational change, um, uh, something that we saw <coughs> in uh, Butler's Erwan, in that farce where he, however, um, represented a certain um, uh, consequence of the theory of evolution, um, which could speed up, and in thinking about technology, technological invention, <coughs> one has to begin thinking about a temporality that is not slow, but discontinuous, abrupt, full of sudden changes and diversions. Um, and so I, I assume Friedrich meant to, to think about language as that kind of Right. Viral, random, and explicable. I understand that that makes it clear, and uh, let us remember Friedrich Hitler. Um, 
I was trying to pull, you're right, um, away from that. I may be wrong. I don't know about mutations in language. I'm still stuck with what some of us discussed recently as paleonymy and its heritage, which is to say that we're stuck with old words, with old structures, and we have to negotiate with them because they, they haven't mutated. Um, we're still stuck in patriarchy. We're still stuck with assholes for leaders. But we still have old, um, maybe obsolesce, but still pumping meaning and uh, things that put us in a, in a um, stranglehold um, so that I understand very well the hope for mutation and random um, emergence and sudden epistemic, I'm, I'm of course hyperbolizing here, Foucauldian, Kitlerian, sudden epistemic, clean cut um, newness or something. I don't believe it. I wish, I wish. So this might be what Lyotard calls a différent, which is to say um, just a disagreement um, with beloved Friedrich and beloved Burroughs and Kathy and maybe you, but maybe I, I'm too simplistic. Um, I just wonder if it isn't a phantasm that language could mutate and that we could suddenly, I haven't seen it happen. I've seen technologies, I've, I've understood the new revelation in Heideggerian terms that technology and new technology purportedly um, the new stage of metaphysical revelation that they mark, but there's something not new about any of it. God was already on a long distance call in the Old Testament and so on and so forth. There's supplementary moments. I'm not saying there's nothing that shifts and all that, but um, I'm not sure. So this, this would be something to, to shelf momentarily and, and maybe continue. I love what you said and I I think it's very stimulating and exciting, and I wish that that would be. I'm just um, digging in here, also to to have the fun of <coughs> having a good workout and starting a little fight here. Could I add? Mm -hmm. and, uh, no. Around the different rooms. Hey, it's not a different room. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I said no. Show me a mutation. I will. <laughs> Another um, example, if it is one, would be the uh, current understanding of the origin of the dog. Um, we no longer, um, for the time being, um, think about it uh, as a long-term evolutionary change, or do we think of um, the influence of domestication alone as separating the dog from the wolf? Um, but now it's postulated through DNA research that at one point in East Asia, there were suddenly, uh, overnight, three or so Eves who, uh, whose changed DNA turned them into close readers of um, human nonverbal communication. They just started following and reading us. <laughs> and out of that developed the relationship to the dog. Now what I love about an anecdote like that, this is really only in the context of evolution, is that um, it gets out of the, um, the linear uh, inheritance of that chimp on our shoulders. <laughs> and we come up with a more random succession of relationalities um, as soon as one can postulate random change at least in history, in our prehistory, so, or the prehistory of the dog. <laughs> well, that one you're arguing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear from Marcus, and then you two, and then we'll have, we will have a break. How's everyone? How's your energy? Can you hang in there? It's hot in here, isn't it? I'm sorry about that. So, um, um, to switch registers slightly, but I would, I would like to return to the word um, that was used, stoned, as a description of being high in the way that stone was connected with um, non-presence. Because I've uh, become very intrigued in the use of this word, stoned. How come when someone smokes weed, they're stoned? And last night, Isaac um, 
gave the example from Heidegger's um, Einführung, uh, or Introduction to Metaphysics, that a stone is belt low, so worldless, which would be the opposite of what the essence of man would be in Heidegger's sense, because man is world forming. So when we take, when we take drugs, what, what exactly is it that happens to our ontological status of being there? And um, we know from reading Derrida carefully, carefully that there really tr truly is no such thing as present being or being present as such. Thank you. We, we will take that up uh, after the break. I just want to hear um, two more interventions. and. Uh, just a, a couple thoughts on possible limit cases for parasitism. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about the parasitism of birth in, in terms of the transaction between bodies, and it made me think of some of the description of the parasitism of the species <coughs> on the member. Um, and that in some ways, that would be a kind of a limit case for what, what can constitute the parasite, right? You have the incorporeal body of the species that's parasitic on, in each case, a historically localized specific particular woman in both life's version of it. Um, and then from the other direction, I was thinking about uh, C.K. Williams' <coughs> poem, It Is This Way With Men, he said. Um, and it's, they're driven into the earth, you know, pounded, they move this inch, they, they're driven again. It is a spiny fruit rotten with them. And, and there's, it was just thinking, sort of thinking about the other, another limit case, I mean, there's any number of limit cases, right? But another limit case for the concept of parasitism seems to be the case in which there's a drivenness, right? So we think of the human as parasitic in the sometimes. Um, but if the human is a male driven into the earth, then I think we're, we're sort of forced to, to question what, what exactly, where do we draw the line? Where do we say, oh, well, in that case, it's not really a parasite. It wasn't. It was. It's, it's forced yeah. into it in some way. So, anyway, so thank you. Two. I, I, Larry and I tend to do something that. Um, thank you very much. That, um, especially teaching when you've um, kind of published so much and spent years um, in solitary doing so. Um, um, we're opening dossiers here. We're trying simply to pop some files, you know, and say, look what's been hidden and what, how many archives we still need to read and probe and consider with concepts or paraconcepts that we thought we had a hold on. And you're absolutely right to complicate the itinerary. And I love C.K. Williams, so thank you for that as well. That's great. Yes. Um, I was interested in the question of how the parasite is incorporated, if the parasite can be incorporated in the body of the ego. And he imagined that uh, looking at this bacterial model of parasitism, because we are host to these bacteria. Absolutely. But it ch they change us, and there's you know positive and negative results, dynamic interaction that can be the cause of some kind of change. Okay, thank you. That's very valuable. So let me let me just say that what we're working with, and then you will wrap it up, what we're working with here are the phantasms and imaginary apps or add-ons that accrue to something that is absolutely, there is no clean body. That would be a hypothesis and that we work on differently, Larry, in terms of uh, vampires and figures of, of um, depletion. Um, there is no clean body. What, what in any case, and, and many parasites are welcome, and we need parasites in certain ways, or bacterial cultures, they're cultures. Um, the, the question is how this becomes a runaway conceptual uh, racist lever, or lover, in some uh, situations, and that's why we go back to the fundamentals to, to point out in our work First of all, the, the vocabulary of, the pernicious vocabulary of parasitism to designate people of color, 
immigrants, the outrageous words, <coughs> illegal aliens. So this is what today's thought is about, is about how to designate the alien and understand all the phantasms, the investments, the politically suspicious rallying around terms that are radically unstable, but have been stabilized to do certain dirty work, you see? And also um, bodies, the, even the metaphorology that relies on clean and dirty is a problem. Of course, Bata, one of Bataille's favorite characters is called Dirty. Um, these oppositions are phantasmatic, are dangerous, and pernicious, and have been on the loose um, in all sorts of ways that we're probing, right? Um, in a sense, one, one is very friendly with dirt, but it becomes something else in terms of all sorts of repressive mechanisms and habits and grammars that Freud also pointed out. Freud pointed out that morality began, all right, are you sitting down still? When uh, we, we started standing erect, and you know that very moral people are said to have their noses in the air, means they stopped sniffing their asses, you know? That clean means up here and um, away from the dirt that we are. So morality started inspecting in, in those terms of our uh, phobic appropriations and designations. So this is what we're exploring, not necessarily with, you know, a, a woman's job is never done. So we do have to know what parasitism is in immunology and science and so on. But that pseudo reality and biologism doesn't intimidate us. We're, we're interested, I think, if I'm not misappropriating, in the phantasmatic misappropriations and, and warpings and distortions that occur in terms of social justice and so on and so forth. So today we became friendly with parasites because we thought we're trying to show philosophically and theoretically and poetically as well um, that there are false sta stabilizations that have pernicious effects even to this day. Of course, to this day. This day is fucked up, you know. So why am I saying even to this day? Um, so would you like to say, and Sasha, when we start again? Yeah, yeah. You okay with that? I'm cool Good, thank you. I just wanted to um, add to the Freudian dossier, the dusting of the other, uh, which you will remember Lacan took up in the ethics seminar. Sure so brilliantly, and I think it goes to the question of the immigrant to the foreign body, because what happens for Lacan is that that becomes almost the site of the traumatic real that sustains the truth of the social, as we know what the Jew became for the Nazis, as the object small a, on the margins of the social. So it's also the proximity to the thinliness of the other, which is the real for Lacan, that fantasy takes place. So I think in Lacan's formulation, we have a very clear conception of this unassimilable excess that is both truth, that is both traumatic, but also sustains the social. Very beautifully recalled, and also this is something that Lacan reiterates and expands upon in his work called Television, where he makes the really scary prediction and statement that will never overcome racism precisely for these reasons, that the other is the carrier of a traumatic stain from which we need to abstain, so that there will always be a target uh, victim or scapegoat or stained being, which will, in one way or another, uh, have to um, be subject or subjected to all sorts of expulsion uh, efforts. So this is something that, I mean, if, if all of Arizona had some Lacanian <laughs> seminars, we could go in and do an emergency um, effort and give them these uh, theoretical case of California, case of Arizona now, sometimes case of Colorado, all of these 
convulsing racist states, if we could do something, a performance like that, hire a big bus like a rock group or something, and go in there and do emergency Lacanian seminars, Derridian Lacanian seminars on racism. Okay, we get our asses hauled into, off into jail, but it's, it's, there's something about that ignorance that, that is something that we naively perhaps still want to address, all of us probably, together. Thank you. These are